Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 537, featuring an interview with Julia Minamata, the creator of the Crimson Diamond. Now this is a retro-inspired EGA uh, text parser <laughs> mystery adventure uh, in the style of those uh, classic Sierra uh, graphical adventure games that we all know and love. Now I'm joined in this interview with uh, my good friend and uh, assistant producer Matt Bradley Shergi, and I uh, really think you'll like this. We're going to be playing the game with Julie, getting her feedback and, and insights and commentary as we go through the uh, uh, early stages of the game. Uh, I think you really like this. We had a lot of fun making it. Uh, so, without further ado, here is Julia Minamata. Or is it recording? Got recording it. in progress. Great. In progress. Give it a minute or so. Nope. So we can. Just me. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Julia. Hi, it's been a long time. It's good to uh, see you again. Yeah, when was that? We talked about this game before. Yeah, I looked it up. It was five years ago. Five years, really? Yes. <laughs> wow, it's fantastic. Oh, my goodness. I saw you said on Twitter that this, or X, I guess, that this was one of the best weeks of your life. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it, for a number of reasons. Like, one of them is for because of stuff like this, where there's been a lot of like these full circle moments where I'm coming back into contact with people that knew about the game from years ago and we're reconnecting and saying, Oh, now it's finally out. I mean, it happened with you. It happened with pushing up roses. It happened with ask Alice, who's a Twitch streamer people whom I haven't heard from in years is coming. We're coming back around and it's, it's a super nice feeling. Yeah. One of the nicest tutorials I think I've ever played. Oh, good. <laughs> good. Yeah. Well, text parser, we don't, we don't see that very much nowadays, but I was hoping that that people would would um, even new people would in, would get to enjoy it too. I think you nailed that. I, <laughs> looks like your your screen. Yeah, there we go. Yep. Yeah, I was uh, thinking back to some of those old Sierra games, and they could be rather nasty. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think you've kind of wanted to avoid that. <laughs> I did. Yes, you I know. did. I, I took a lot of um, lessons both way from. Yeah, both types of lessons of like stuff I I liked about the games and stuff I wasn't so fond of, and I tried to bring that all into what I made. I really was. Um, I haven't played a whole lot of the game. I believe I have it to save games from chapter two or something to skip mm -hmm. over some of the um, dialogue in the beginning. But I like this notebook <laughs> as a modern sort of concession to uh, mm -hmm. to games, where you sort of you know a checklist of what your next quest is, so to speak. Yeah, uh, Thimbleweed Park was my inspiration for that because they had one of those, and I found it extremely useful. Oh my god, yes. Yeah, that's one of the problems I've run into. I played a lot of these games, and not you know, a lot of times you don't really know what you're supposed to do next, and mm -hmm. you know, you're just totally lost, and you're just wandering around the whole game, clicking mm -hmm. on everything. <laughs> so, yeah, I think something like this makes a big difference. There's this, and also there's a parser function that uh, you can type. You can type a review in, at any point, and it will tell you like what your top level thing is to do. Yeah. Oh, it doesn't take you to the Steam page to write a review. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good, good. idea. There, there's only one like hyperlink in the game, and it's to the online hint book. But it would have been fun to add other things too. Did you consider having the hint book being in game, kind of like with Return to Monkey Island? I. For me, I felt like I might have had I figured out how to do that. Like a lot of times my design decisions are based around what I can do and what I don't know how to do. And for me, in this case, the easiest the easiest thing to do was to just have a hyperlink that linked to an outside web page where I could easily update that as I need to as well. Sure. Um, so here, I guess, where do we find the boo drawer? Mm that is upstairs yeah there's um there's a map in the game it's not a fast travel map or anything like that but it was a way for people to learn how to orient themselves in the lodge although the, the lodge the lodge map is not um the same as the current lodge map because the lodge map was back when the crimson lodge was an inn and it is no longer but did you did you manage to get um, the map yourself i don't know let's see yeah let's check your inventory okay so you know we didn't but that's uh it's not really super necessary it was kind of a late addition to the game where i wanted um, people just to have it so they'd had some sort of visualization of what the lodge looked like like a bird's eye view and also 
you know, another inventory item that they could kind of play with in, in chapter one. But yeah, the, the boudoir is over to the left. Okay. Did you find it tricky with you have so many, you know, only so many frames of animation to work with. And when you're moving up and down, it can come sometimes look like she's sliding a bit. Yeah, she does look like she's sliding. I think her, her up and down walk animation cycles like four frames total. And some of the other characters have even stiffer looking up and down walk animations. And it's, an, it's a case of, oh, I might go back and fix that later. And I did for some of them, actually. For some of the characters, I did go back and I fixed that up and down walk animation. But um, some of them I did not. It's and a tricky perspective to draw, too. Yes. Right? It's very, they have all the layers tricky. of this clothing from the time period and uh, and so forth. Yeah, I, I ended up not, not uh, updating it. Okay, now she goes. There we go. I hear voices near the doorway. I wonder what they're talking about. Eavesdrop. <laughs> yeah. Let's do a listen. You can hear muffled voices in the boudoir, but the speakers are too far from the door for you to hear them clearly. Perhaps you can listen at a door with an item that would help. Ah. Oh. Mm. And then this is cool because it's a hint, right? But it's what she's thinking. Mm. If I can't figure out what to use, maybe someone else would know. So that's how you know it's designed by a designer that cares about <laughs> players. I need all the help I can get. It's it's also a result of me kind of watching people play it, not only at events, but uh, Twitch streamers have right. been playing it. And when people would all, you know, commonly get stuck on the same points, I, I did try to smooth those points over and give them a number of ways to figure that out. Well, and it's really hard to have the objectivity when you're designing the game and you yes. even have played it 10,000 times. And yeah. You can do it in your sleep, and what you think might be hard might be obvious to, to someone. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's, and It's easy for me. I designed it. Yeah. <laughs> is that this particularly in this case, because it is a text parser where you do have to generate the sentences yourself, and people have different ways of writing things and different words for different items, and yeah, it's, it's super educational to watch people play it. So I bet I have to go downstairs and get like a that... glass or something. Mm. Do you look in that bookshelf? Oh, <laughs> sure. Yeah, look in that bookshelf. Not very interesting, cool, interesting books. Set dressing. <laughs> There's an uninteresting book here called Dungeons and Desktops. What? <laughs> <laughs> so it it's um Maybe you Luke. always wanted to make it have a text driven parser from the start, it seems. Yes. That right? Yeah, that was important to me because I love the text parser interface. They were my favorite adventure games to play were the text parser ones. Um, I was not particularly good at them, but I did like that feeling of limitless possibility. And I, yeah, I didn't really consider doing it doing it another way. I wanted um, people to get the chance to play them because nowadays it's not super common to see a text parser games. How many crazy answers? <laughs> <laughs> like if he was, if he said something like "touch the hot stove," I mean, how many wacky <laughs> right. responses did you code in? <laughs> uh, some no, I mean whenever someone tries something and I'm watching them try it and then it doesn't give them a fun response I feel like I want to add it there's always that impulse but yeah, there's, there's a few of them that actually that actually do work well, I love I think it was in Space Quest 4 there's an icon that smell that yeah. it's pretty useless but it's almost all for funny <laughs> responses yes yes yeah you can actually smell in this game too I mean it does come in handy in a few places but I don't know about now <laughs> yeah your nose yeah. doesn't notice anything of note. It's good alliteration. <laughs> yeah, you got sort of a, what do you call that little item that she's got in her inventory? It looks like a magnifying glass. Yeah, the loop. It's the her, loop? Yeah, yeah, it's her magnifying glass. Yeah. How does that work? Yeah, so it's just a matter of, um, it's just um, inventory interaction within the inventory window. Um, it's for looking and examining. Oh, yeah. okay. So you're doing. So if you found a certain diamond. Yeah, you can, yes, take a closer look. Oh, it works on there. Yeah. Admire <laughs> the minute dots that comprise the newspaper photograph of a round cut diamond. Uh, the natural diamond described in the article would be an octahedron, not a faceted specimen. What an embarrassing inaccuracy. Oh, that would be horrifying. <laughs> and that, so it looks like I'll need some hints, unfortunately, unless we want me to be stuck for this whole I stream. So, go back to that room you were in, Matt. There was well, one that had like, looked like some glasses. Which one? The one I was in before? Upstairs? Like a dining room is what it looked like. Oh, me. oh yes, sure. Right here on the right. Yeah, I wonder if, oh, I guess that's, I was thinking oh, maybe it's a cup well, to the ear. Glasses, right? Look. Get glass. 
yeah, those have the stems on them, so they won't be good no, for the listening. They wouldn't be good for oh. the listening. Yeah, they are well, tumblers. Can, oh, yeah. there, now there's oh. another hint. Very good. Yes, maybe there we I go. Can find ah. versatile drinking glasses in the kitchen. I was in the kitchen, we were, but we I were didn't. on the right track. Yes. Yeah. So. There's just a lot of cupboards in the lodge, and also, especially <laughs> yes. in the kitchen, there are a lot of cupboards to go through. Um, Uh, up maybe if i did this open all cupboards <laughs> uh, i actually try to look look in or say a search cover. oh i see yeah, yeah, yeah. There. huge heavy pots and pans a couple of decorative plates and some mugs i bet that mug the pretty blue mug <laughs> maybe get, not bug get mug which is uh, the mascot for adventure game studio in fact is uh it's called the blue cup in Oh, and I did oh. indeed make this game in Adventure Game Studio, and it was my little Easter egg. And a lot of Adventure Game um, Studio creators do put a blue cup in their game, blue mug. Oh, I didn't know that. Did you find YouTube good for tutorials as you were learning the yes. uh, domain yeah. system? Absolutely, yeah. I, that was my main way of learning how to use Adventure Game Studio. There is um, like a 40-plus part series on um, and how to use it. Yeah, and it's like little 10 minute videos to, that cover a bunch of different aspects. Oh, and that was you know, a really good introduction to the point of I was so grateful for them that I ended up making my own YouTube tutorial video that's about an hour and a half that kind of covers all the basics super quickly. And uh, that was wow. that's a very um, one of my most popular videos on my YouTube channel is that one particularly. And I actually got a comment on the video saying that there was someone who was taking some game design course in college or, or I think it was college and their professor told them to watch the video that I had made as an introduction to that engine right. which I felt really I thought that was really cool that's yeah, cool that's I um give it back to the community yeah yeah do you have a, a background in game design or what led you to make this game yeah I, I don't I I went to college for for art actually for illustration and I did a bit of um computer programming in like high school, possibly. We had, um, there was a teaching language called Turing, which was actually um, created in Toronto, Ontario, which is where I'm from. And uh, it was based on, I think, Pascal and Euclid and a few other things. And it was made specifically to to teach um, basics of computer programming. So I, I I did a bit of that in in high school, but then, and a bit of Java maybe in high school as well. But then I, all through college, I never did anything. And, and, and way way after college, I also didn't have any. So I feel like I, I did have a little bit of background, but not really that much. I would consider myself kind of a super beginner programmer. And I, I learned a lot along the way, thanks to Adventure Game Studio being such an, an easy to use tool and all the tutorials and the forums that I got help in. So let's say we found with the help of the drinking glass, mm -hmm. you can hear a conversation behind the boudoir door. Yeah, hard to see, say. that's what I love about door. these games. It makes you feel like a genius. <laughs> <laughs> Every, like, well, and part of it is do. like what we had when we solved the puzzle earlier. It does the little chime with the animation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I notice a little thing pops up and it's like, well done. Yes. Oh, I don't remember really. seeing that. That must be, I don't think that was in the version I played originally. Um, yeah, probably not. That was um, a bit of a mid-time kind of addition. And it's another example of something that wasn't in, you know, the old Sierra and LucasArts games. They had like a chime, like a point sound. But I realized that if people are not playing with sound on, or if they are hard of hearing, it's an like, accessibility thing. I want there to be a visual cue that they did something correctly if they don't have access to that to the, the noises. Um, that was just something I, I kind of decided. And they, those are, t you can turn those off because some people are more, you know, purists about this. And they might not want that. So that's something you can toggle off if you desire. Um, as well, there's also a text inventory that you can toggle on as well. If you don't want the graphical inventory, because back in the day, the Sierra EGA games did not have graphical inventories. I like all the positive affirmation I can get. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, um, oh, it was, I, I was talking to someone the other day about, uh, Mist, I guess they came mm -hmm. out with the new version in VR, yeah. and I said Mist I didn't like as much as the CR or LucasArts ones because those had people you could talk to, and it's like mm -hmm. I don't want to play a game to feel more lonely about myself. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, I, th I think that was one of my my issues when I first played Mist back in the day was it felt really lonely, it felt really desolate, um, and that can be like a nice meditative space to be in as well. But I'm with the same way; I like to be able to interact with the characters and be in like a setting that that has a lot of stuff in it. Oh, so now we're advancing later that night look at the pixel art on this Oof. here we go chapter oh, one right. complete yes i think there's even steam achievements for this there is yes. one just yeah. popped up yeah, yeah there are. how hard was that was that easy to put that in there 
Um, relatively so, only because, I, again, I got a lot of help from like other AGS developers, like Francisco Gonzalez, who made Lamplight City, and is, he's currently working on Rosewater. So he's he's one of the people that knows much more about this stuff than I do. And he, he gave me the resources and told me the steps I needed to take to, to be able to do that. That's what I got. So when this. it is, this is really good in the weeds here, but that's what we do. Oh, wait, your music so, volume went back up. It did. Oh, did it? Oh, I wonder uh, why that was so loud. Maybe. Oh, maybe we found a bug. Oh, maybe we found a bug. <laughs> that would not. Oh, be I'm, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said anything. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> this is good. Well, I mean, it could be. Yeah, when, did you load a game potentially? No, no, could no. It... Well, I just okay. clicked on load game because I wanted to show okay. you when it does auto save. Was it hard to determine what to make the text here? On the oh, autosave? um. It was just a matter of I wanted it to be descriptive enough so if people were going back through their save games, there would be it would be obvious what was their save game and what wasn't. Like that's why I started those auto saves with like an exclamation point and colon just mm -hmm. to differentiate them and to number them as well so you knew vaguely what chronologically what order they came in if you kind of were replacing and and, and saving out of order. Great. That must have been I, I saw it on um on X, I guess. You mentioned you got a nice note from Roberta Williams about the game. <laughs> yes. Oh yes. yeah. That that was that was something else. Um, yeah, I was fortunate enough to be able to attend the Adventure Game Hotspot Fanfare, which was back in July, and they actually sponsored me to go. I, I participated in a couple of the panels, and uh, I met Roberta Williams and a bunch of other Sierra alumni were there. An incredible amount, actually. It was they also had it almost like a mini Sierra reunion, and um, yeah, it was it was my first time ever meeting her. She she was very very kind and very supportive. I even got to give her I, an award at the award ceremony. They actually, I got to induct her into the Adventure Game Hall of Fame for oh, Mystery wow. House, the work she did on Mystery House, which again felt like a super full circle moment because if you here told me when I was, you know, at my computer keyboard when playing the Colonel's Bequest and being terrified that one day, not even that long from then, I would be handing Roberta Williams an award at an award ceremony. I Yeah, it would totally blow my mind. And yeah, she I sent her the demo and she played a bit of the demo and and she said, yeah, I mean, she understands how important something like a blurb could be for like being on the Steam page and everything. So she was incredibly supportive. I'm super fortunate. She's so wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. I always think, I wonder if you could go back in time and like show, show them this game back in their heyday. If they would have been <laughs> like, yeah, we're definitely publishing that. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes I feel like my timing is a little bit off. <laughs> in, a, well, in a way, but we got so many people that grew up playing those and they... Yeah. Here we are again. Yeah, and and honestly, I like I said, I I have the advantage of learning from you know YouTube tutorials and having Adventure Game Studio as this engine that I could use that is purpose built for adventure games. That I couldn't have made this game any at any other time than than now, and I feel fortunate that I'm able to. I wonder if that engine is based at all on the one that Sierra was using. Yes, in fact, yeah, it was. It was actually uh, based on um, the SCI Zero engine, specifically the the Space Quest Four engine, uh -huh. um, and then they they've just been building on it from there. I think it's been it's been around since ninety five or ninety seven or something like that. It's been around a long time. A lot of great games built with that. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's it's my favorite uh, Sierra engine. You know, they they built um, Quest for Glory Two, I believe, is SCI Zero and Colonel Jump Quest off. And... <laughs> Mass. See, see, this is yeah. Now, if she were mean, she had to let you just jump to your death. Yeah, just walk off, and the banister would just collapse. <laughs> yeah, you had to like get just the right, just yeah, the right. Oh, uh, the um. Yeah. What was it? I think the first Sierra I played was I. I grew up in Latin America as a kid, and so we um. But anyhow, they had a, a computer lab with the Apple II computers, mm. and they had the Black Cauldron. Oh. And so recently being able to stream that, it was really interesting to, um, it doesn't have a text parser. They try to make it more simple, but that makes it more complicated in some ways. <laughs> yeah, I've seen Let's Plays of it. I, lo I love the art on that one. Um, I, I actually like the AGI engine, like the, the bulkier graphics as well. And I do want to try my hand at, at doing that, uh, recreating that style too. Yeah, and it's... Um... That they did something like Police Quest with that bulkier style kind of blows my mind. That must have mm -hmm. been tricky yeah. to do it more. I, I saw I told people on Discord I was we'd be doing this and a couple of them sent in some questions. Yeah, great. <laughs> you want to hear the, the question? Yeah. Some of them. Okay, this is Miko. Oh yeah. What were the challenges of bringing the CGA style art style to modern PCs? And why did you choose that over more mainstream full color pixel art? <laughs> 
the challenges the challenges of the palette are i suppose just inherent in what the palette is on its own is it's got it's got four four blues and two greens no oranges it's it's there's no particular anything that you might call a flesh tone of any color it's all it's all very bright and bold that that, that was one of the challenges i would say but Honestly, I had access to, you know, the internet's worth of screenshots of EGA games, not just Sierra, but LucasArts and other studios. It was a real education in in what could be done with it and different techniques and how to do lighting and shadow and and depth and, and everything in it. It was not it was not super challenging, I think also because of my background as an illustrator. I was a freelance illustrator for more than 10 years and um, art art was kind of like my strong point. It was so it was not too bad to kind of go from what I was doing already as an illustrator, which is already kind of like a limited palette, silk screen print type of artwork to doing a um, 16 color artwork. Because it actually meant I was using more colors than it was, I was using in my actual illustrations. Um, and the decision to go with EGA is, is basically because I just love the palette so much. It was, it, it kind of went hand in hand with the text parser where they kind of combined to be this perfect childhood memory that I, I wanted to recreate and I wanted to recreate that memory for other people. You're the perfect person then. <laughs> so I'm just wondering if Matt's going to try to jab himself with anything. <laughs> oh, that's a good question. Um, oh, my goodness. I don't think so. But <laughs> you found the glass. You did, did find the glass. We well, look at all I'm trying to get inventory of what I'm supposed to meet with the. Uh, well, it's like a ski or saw back there. Was... Yep. Surely you need to get some of those tools. <laughs> Oh, I tried, but it said it didn't have the useful tool in there. Mm. Uh, well, maybe you have to find, is it one of those games where you have to find the use for it before you can pick it up? Uh, no, there are actually, there's a lot of examples in the game I'm where you can sorry. pick stuff up much earlier than you need it. Okay. Because I couldn't, I couldn't think of a way to make it so it would not be so, uh, which, which means it can be a little bit confusing sometimes, but um, there are no soft locks in the game. Like you can't, you can't stop yourself from progressing if you missed something. A soft lock. Mm -hmm. what is the soft lock again oh the soft lock just means that yeah if you miss something earlier on in a game you cannot progress further into the game oh uh, but you can still like move around it's not like you know like a hard lock or whatever would be like you crashing the game or dying or something where it's very obvious that you can no longer continue soft lock is you feel like you could continue but it's just impossible just because of the way the game's been designed which is not something that people care for particularly and i did design the game with that consideration i didn't want that to happen is there a moment when you played a game as a kid and you got stuck in a soft lock or not even as a kid but just one that you remember being especially onerous well i i, I would say my first thought is in uh, in hugo's uh, whodunit or hugo says a horse those games there's there's yeah. a potential of like losing a, a book of matches potentially by trying to cross a bridge and after which you yeah you can't um you can't win the game there's a few examples like that i think even in other games too but that's the first one that came to my mind um, and no one likes that. No, that's a, they're fairly common in the old Sierra ones too, right? Yeah, yes. yeah. And this music, yeah. yeah. Speaking of um, what the game looks like, I do want to talk about how what the game sounds like. And and, and Dan Policar did this wonderful uh, MT32 soundtrack. The game looks like the old th old games. It sounds like the old games because it uses the same tool that the Sierra folk were using oh. to make their music which I, I just am so glad that he took that step. I would never ask him to do that, but he kind of took it upon himself. He wanted to recreate the sound and not just the look. And I think it really worked out well. I love the music. Mm. Definitely. Really soothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was, I was very specific about what I wanted. I, I told him, you know, I wanted it to be overall like kind of folk toony and not, not too intense overall. Like it's very cozy and, and, and Canadian folk toony. And he did a fantastic job. Yeah, cozy is a good word. Yeah. Yeah, I, and cozy is kind of like a whole genre of mysteries, like Agatha Christie type of mysteries. You, oh, know, yeah. you have, yeah, like you know, her, her girl pro row, and you have Father Brown, and you have a bunch of different types of mystery series that, that have a certain type of a tone, and that's definitely what I was aiming for. Did you know, in, I, I think it's in the 80s or 90s, there's a Puro anime. An anime? Yeah. Oh. No. It, look no. it up on YouTube. It's pretty bizarre. I think it's Hero <laughs> and Marple or something team up, but it's. Oh my uh, goodness. <laughs> I, I saw that and I was sort of shocked. But Wow. Yeah, I've never heard I, of that. I was getting music. into it from some of the, you know, Kenneth Branagh has done the more recent, um, oh you know, remakes of the Murder in the Orient Express. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So forth. Um, yeah. So this here, when people are talking and the lips are moving, mm -hmm. is that um, lip synced or. 
No, <laughs> no, it's very, very basic. There's a, there's so there's a speech animation where they kind of go through a bunch of different mouth movements, and then there's this blinking animation where after they're finished talking or they would have finished talking, they just have have a like a, yeah you can see Kimmy here is right just there. blinking. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's that's it's not it's not doing any type of lip sync or anything like that. It's the most simplistic way to achieve this effect. And yet, it still gives a lot of character, right? Seeing those close-ups, yeah. it's a little bit like the Gabriel Knight mm -hmm. in a way. And it, um, what was I going to say? Did you ever, um, and all the dialogue in this, did you ever consider doing a version with voices? Or... <laughs> Um, I did not. And there's there's a bunch of different reasons for that. One of them is cost. I, I self-funded yes. this, yeah. self-published this. Another one is labor and time and expertise, all of which I also lacked um, to do this. I, I know and I admire greatly the, the developers who do have voice acting in their games. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's an incredible cost and, and time commitment. And also like just to do the lip sync and to, you know... Um, edit the audio and do everything that you need to and do the file for that. Si the file size of the game too would be yes uh, the file size as well as yeah. well um yeah i mean ega the text parser games didn't really have voices in them either so that's sure. also it would have been a bit strange i mean i would have done it had i felt like maybe and all those other obstacles were, were not in the way but um i actually prefer the game as it is where it's kind of more like a book than a movie I, and right. it's it's kind of a, a game where there is a pause button in the game, but you don't really need it because nothing is going to move if you don't move first. It's it's kind of the the players setting the pace, which I really I really like when, in this type of game, and, and that also goes for yeah having voices where you know the voice is is not being read at at your pace. So you can read these at your pace at your leisure. You could leave. You can just get up now and leave and come back, and nothing would have changed. Um, the the dialogue is not on timers. Um, another aspect of it is I am still changing the text in this game. Uh, I started making the game, you know, many years ago. Most of the the production development happened within the last six years, I would say. But uh, that's still a long time ago. And there is writing that is inconsistent between six years ago and, you know, last week. And I need to make these corrections. And I couldn't do that if the the writing had been locked, if the dialogue had been locked. Um and I, I appreciate that that I have that freedom to adjust lines as I need to adjust them, um, which is not something you can do. You could do it with voice acting, but it's not as easy to do as me just changing the, the writing in the game. Yeah, I've heard a lot of other developers talk about how they wouldn't have used the voice acting. Mm. If they had known what they were getting into. <laughs> just locked them in. You know, they could, like you say, and some, yeah. I've played a lot of games right. where the voice acting doesn't match the text. And you're like, mm. what's going on here? Sure. <laughs> Yeah, and there's also if you look through old issues of like Sierra Interaction magazine, they'll say, oh, they had a planned uh, a voice version of Police Quest Three that never happened. There was going to mm. do Space Quest Five with voices. Um, it's a lot of different things like that. And with, I mean, let's see. So when you're you're making this character and you're trying to come up with the name for the game, the Crimson Diamond, you said it spent you know six years at least working mm. on it. Was the title something that came early or it sort of changed as you went along? The title came, uh, yeah, probably, If I feel like fairly late on. I think that I really felt like I needed to have a title um, in about, I guess, 2018 when I first publicly showed the game. Um, I showed the demo here in Toronto at, at an event called Wordplay, which is a narrative game showcase. And that's when I really needed to have a, a name. And, and that's when I, I did I eventually pick the name. But I did have help. Uh, I, I had a lot of trouble deciding what the name was going to be. And even when I picked the name, the Crimson Diamond, I was not super, super fond of it. And I think it just kind of grew on me over time. And I do think for what for, for what it is, I think it's, it's a really good title for it because, uh, you know, the, 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 the setting of the game ended up being Crimson Ontario. So it's kind of a, a nice thing. And Crimson Diamond, when people hear that, they kind of give pause because, you know, that, 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 those are two words that don't really go together so well. Um, and also they're easy to spell and it's easy to say. I think, I think it was a good choice and I'm glad that I went with it, but I had a lot of trouble picking this name. That sounds like a good, good old mystery novel. Yeah. Story. Yeah. Like that type of pulpy type of name. Yeah. Why Ontario? Why Ontario? Ontario partly because I, I was born and raised in Ontario, um, good, but good also, <laughs> also because, yeah, I mean, I, I grew up knowing that that there are a lot of towns in Ontario that got their start with 
you know, some kind of natural resource. Um, like for instance, Sudbury is known as the big nickel, it's a big nickel mining place, and it still is. Um, we also have like amethyst mines up in uh, like the Thunder Bay area. And even, you know, there are diamond mines in Northern Ontario and in Northern Canada that happened way further on than, than this game. Like the, those diamond mines um, were actually in, active like in the early 2000s, but that does, the diamonds were still there, right? But um, just not found yet. It, geogra so ge geographically, and geologically, it does work for for the setting, and that's part part of the reason why as well. I thought there might be some grants, or yeah, <laughs> um, I did get one grant um, from from Pixels, which is a Montreal based organization. It was um, a BIPOC Black Indigenous Person of Color um, grant that uh, that they were really wonderful and supportive, and I got to upgrade my computer during production, which is really nice. Excellent. Yeah. So no, there's no reports of diamonds being found in a fish. <laughs> Not that part, but the rest of it is is pretty realistic <laughs> in terms of like the setting and the general the the, the location. I, I there's no specific like you know longitude and latitude coordinates for Crimson Ontario, but I I've been saying it's kind of in that uh, Hudson Bay Lowlands, James Bay James Bay Lowlands, which is yeah, it's it's known to be possible that diamonds could be there. Yeah, you better save it here, Matt. <laughs> I, got, I got a bad feeling about this. Oh, no! Gotta, that's part of the games. You got to see how you die. Yeah. You can. Oh, Matt. Yeah. I, I actually saved it. That oh. flailing animation, I actually was like, I was thinking of King Graham or Sir Graham in the early, like the way he, <laughs> he would flail that same yes. way. And I was kind of thinking of that when I made that. I do wish I could have put more deaths in the game. Need warnings. Stay away from dangerous bodies of yeah. water. Cautionary tale. I think was it King's Quest Four when you die, it's Roberta Williams that admonishes you. Yes. That... <laughs> yes. And people have been telling me I should do that because I have my profile photo, my profile picture I use on social media is like this EGA portrait of myself, so I could easily have put my own face in that and just said, "Next time, be more careful," or whatever she says. Yeah. Yeah. So the music was good there too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Also, yeah, also composed by Dan. There, that that was a bug though. Like you, you heard that same death jingle and it kept on repeating itself that is that was something i noticed that when people were playing it that they wouldn't have noticed but i did notice because it's only supposed to play once and in the, in the update that i'm working on currently that will be fixed what's matt doing now well oh, there's know. a whistle in the log oh yes there huh. is. oh it's there's a duck, duck call, call. <laughs> that's a good eye i saw something sparkling in the log yeah yeah Oh, okay. Let's. Where was the sparkling thing? Oh no, that was the sparkling thing. You, oh, you, it was you, the you totally got it. There must be a duck you need to call. <laughs> Watch this. You have to look every single look in every hole. Try to open everything. Mm -hmm. What do you do with Ryan. the? Oh, a duck call. How do you whistle with the duck call? I think uh, I think I was gonna do it. So I think he's on the right track. See, look at that. Yeah. Oh, F A Allen. One must. I think that was an actual brand of duck call, if I do recall oh, of that of that wow. era. It's been a while, so I, there's so much I don't remember that I put in this game, but I'm assuming that's what the case is. You put the duck call mm -hmm. to your lips and blow. Uh, <laughs> here comes the duck dynasty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no duck, no duck, no duck, bad duck. Mm -hmm. This is, I mean, so. Mazes used to be a part of some of these mm -hmm. older games. Is that are there mazes in this one? <laughs> no, oh. no, I, I never cared for the mazes in this game. Um, sorry, in those in those types of games, and um, <laughs> accomplish my goals. Ah. Uh, <laughs> as easy as that. Although you know, I was thinking about that this bridge. I was thinking of if the player was to cross it, like the game would just quit <laughs> and exit. <laughs> There's um, I really like what you do with the transparency here with things like doors and buildings oh, that you. you're walking behind. Yeah, this this is a case of me designing this background without that consideration and then realizing that you I had to do something like that because otherwise you wouldn't be able to see her for most of the screen. That was my fault. Um, you'd notice that in a lot of those Sierra and LucasArts games, they don't actually have a, a screen that's set up like this for good reasons. That they don't have to mm -hmm. do what I eventually had to do when I realized why they don't. Uh, so I did learn a lot huh. from 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 making this. But this is nice here too, right? You see, you saw this in the old in some of the Sierra games where it's yes. kind of this cutout. Yeah, Yes. Yeah, it's expertly done. I I enjoyed very much, yeah, to to recreate these types of things. 
And just to give us a sense of this, how long did it take to, to draw all of this for this scene here? Uh, I got I got faster as I got as I went along um, to the point of one of the like in one of the ending sequences, there's a background that's pretty elaborate, I would say. And that maybe took me a couple of days. It might have taken me three. Was I not in a panicked rush? But uh, two days to do just something that would have looked like something like this. But probably when I was making this, this one, it probably took a bit longer, especially with the cutaway. Um but yeah, people do ask me what what took the longest of the artwork or the programming or anything. And I, I'm thinking back, it's really hard to say, but I might have to say for me, it might have been the programming because there's so much I had to figure out for this one where even stuff as mundane as menus and what cur what the cursor is going to look like when certain menus are up and all, and all that. Um, getting all that set up was a lot of work and I got stuck quite a few times on working on those parts. Which makes me kind of really excited to, to work on the sequel, which I do have planned, because I'm thinking there's all this stuff that I had to struggle to set up that I now can just move into the to the next game and, and that'll be a time saver. I bet yeah, sticking with the same engines or development tools uh, certainly helps. And mm -hmm. what do you think about this? This struck me the other day when I was uh, playing this. In adventure games are often, you know, trying to you're solving puzzles, use this with that. If I have this, then I can do that. Isn't that not kind of like programming itself? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think language is very much like that. In fact, I've had people say that when they're playing the game, they feel like hackers when, when they're entering <laughs> stuff into that text parser, which I think was kind of funny. But in a way, yeah, I mean, I remember the DOS command prompt and, and feeling like you could just type sure. whatever in there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that was a game, wasn't it, Matt? Just hacker and you started at a DOS prompt or something, <laughs> right? You're trying to... Yeah, I think so. <laughs> trying to hack into a system. No, even like a lot of games will have console commands that you can use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's been right. modern ones, I think, that had some console commands. There must be some way you can use that canoe back there. There has to. Oh, she's looking for the red. Yeah. Red cormorants. Um, cormorants? How do you say that? Yeah, steel. the cormorants, yeah. Can't steal. Steal woman. Steal <laughs> woman. <laughs> Trying to pickpocket and look, thinking of oh, yeah. quest for glory. She's trying to look for some kind of birds, but there's, right. I guess there's a danger she might disturb them. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay, the double crested cormorant is distinctly large with a swan like neck, webbed feet, and bright orange beak. Uh, so, cer certainly, with a lot of these games, they have, um, you know, the descriptions are a big part of it. Mm -hmm. Is there any that you looked at to sort of inspire you? Any books you read, maybe, where you're like, oh, I like the descriptions here? Um, for the actual writing, I guess I just o over time I've read a lot of like mystery books and things. So that's that's probably what what figured into it um, in terms of the type of writing. I also knew that I wanted to keep the text like the text boxes are very big because the type is very big and the resolution is pretty low. So I knew I also had to be very brief with the text description. Just like it yeah. would just cover the whole screen. Yeah. Um, so so the, those are my two considerations. Is yeah, like a lot of reading and. <laughs> well, I saw something about a duck. I tried the duck call here because yeah. they were birds. And oh, she thinks. Oh, get to, the bag. She wants Suitcase. To the case. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> Suitcase. Oh. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> what? Um, this game actually is set in like late August, which is kind of the time of year we are in now. And it is actually cormorant nesting season. And I just went last weekend to see, I saw some nesting cormorants, not on a cliffside. They were actually on, on a beach, kind of in a sandy, sandy area um, on a bit of an island part at um, Presqu'ile Provincial Park. Um, so it's an actual thing at this time of year. You, you can see nesting cormorants if you go to the right places. This it's description like definitely seems real right out of a Sierra game. You imagine the double crested oh, yeah. cormorant would raise a bit of a fuss if you tried to put it in your pocket. <laughs> yes, um, I think I've just internalized so much Sierra writing that yes. it's just something that just comes out naturally for me. I didn't actually have to go back. Although to be fair, I have been. I watch a lot of Let's Plays of on mm -hmm. Twitch of people retro Twitch streamers um, playing like, lots of adventure games. So that's probably also like my refresher course. I also I also stream um, on Tuesdays at at, at eight p.m. Eastern. And I've been playing a lot of like old games, like not necessarily Sierra games, but old um, EGA adventure games and just getting in touch with like the, the way they use EGA and also like how they wrote stuff and things like that. It's been super educational. And the way they use dithering too. I mean, that mm -hmm. does so much with the, the lighting, so to speak here. Right? Yes. Yeah. I, I, I love this particular kind of like that checkerboard dithering. There's also some real fascinating way, uh, ways of dithering. There's a game called Mortville Manor by Lancor Games. And it, it's it's actually, I think, a higher resolution than this, but because it's a higher resolution, they actually have like this weird vertical dithering that's just vertical lines to, to um, which is, I've never seen that before. That was, that fascinated me. Okay. What is dithering? 
Oh yeah, it's just um this kind of that checkerboard pattern that you see on like for instance the front of this carriage house to give the impression of another color when we only have the sixteen Ah. colors. Yeah, yeah. And in that case, it looks like it might be white or gray, the checkerboard, but something Yeah, that's black. um the light magenta and the dark gray. Um, Okay. it's like a checkerboard pattern where when we you know when if you were to zoom in on it, you would see like these squares. But because we're further back from it, you get this impression that there it's a blended color. Which is something I love again about EGA that you don't really see in in other color palettes, like especially VGA or, or above. That looks gray. It looks pink to me. <laughs> Am I in my vision off? well, it's it's gray and magenta, so it's 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 um it's it would kind Oh, of is this somewhat one of those like blue dress situations? <laughs> yes, Oh, this is, yeah. but it's like one pixel next to another. I mean, it's quite small. Yeah, The... it's part of the magic of of dithering and EGA. It's clever. I kind of get a little bit of a Nancy Drew vibe. Uh, uh... Mm -hmm, I love those games. mm -hmm. You know, I've never played Nancy Drew games, but that's another example of inspirations where I read a lot of Nancy Drew books when I was growing up. Yeah, Nancy Drew and Hardy Boys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Hardy Boys as well. Yeah, exactly. I think there's even another, like Bobsy Twins. Yes. I never read Bobsy Twins, but yes, I do remember Bobsy Twins as well. Hey. Hey. <laughs> Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> I bet there's something in that hey. Yes. Oh. Yes, for horses, it's said. That's good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't fall Oh, off love. the ledge. Ah. Yeah. Mm hmm Yeah, that's a something, another thing where it's just a bit of a missed opportunity. But again, I didn't want to make it too easy to die. Um, I made people work for the deaths. I think also like the tone of it, I don't know if all like bloody deaths would have been appropriate where you can fall off every ledge or Yeah. now maybe if you use like that blockier style of the earlier King's Mm Quest, hmm right? Where there's more opportunity for, or have you played this one called Stair Quest? Oh, yeah, I was just thinking about that. I have not played Stair Quest, but I've seen people play it and I think it's ingenious. It's yes, it's, Yes. I don't know if it's, it's delightfully infuriating. Mm hmm to to play Mm hmm and um but the reactions Yes. on those are very funny Uh, I love I love the fact that that's also a text parser game. It it almost feels like you don't even need a text parser at all. You just need arrow keys. But I love the fact that this there's an elaborate text parser system with a ton of responses. yes <laughs> more set Yes. we had Yes. him on the show yeah not too long ago you've reached the western limit of the property To the north, you see the carriage house, the, the rushing waters to the south, east leads deeper into the woods. Even descriptions There's a bullpen. like that, um, like stuff Yeah. like Zork and things, like I was Yes. definitely taking a page from from all kinds of different places for the writing. Push folder. Wouldn't it be amazing if you could just push that on that guy? All right, hit man. <laughs> Oh, oh. get tackle box. Is that a tackle box? I don't know what it is. Hit suitcase. Maybe it's look ground. Yeah, ground. Or look, uh, look at, look at, Mm. wait, here we go. Oh, okay. So here, uh, here's one. I mean, so with this kind of cozer, cozy murder mystery sort of thing, you know, the very first game Sierra did was Mystery House. Mm Have you ever gone back and play that? -hmm. Played I have that, not. or did you do? Oh, Um, okay. but I It's I actually watched a let's play of it. That's what that's yeah. how I It. tend to experience a lot of games nowadays. It's really weird to go and play it in with the with how the parser is and just how Roberta had to draw all those herself Mm -hmm. when it was really hard to do so and just the technology Yeah. to get it even working. Yeah. I yeah. Like going back to that adventure game hotspot fanfare, there were there were some panels about you know the Sierra folk talking about what it was like to to develop a game back in those days. And it's incredible because not only were they making the games, they were developing the tools to to make the games at the same time. Right. Um, yeah, I have so much admiration for. Um, yeah, there's even uh, Robert Heitman, who was one of the architects of the SCI engine, was there, and I did get to meet him, and I got him to sign my Colonel's Bequest box, and that was good times. Oh, cool. Girls <laughs> Quest is a good one. yeah, I got yeah, a copy I. of right over there. Yeah, I've got my copy. It's, it's signed by Ken and Roberta now, and Ken Allen, who made the music, and Robert Heitman and Doug Herring, who did the art. So it's it's getting filled full up. <laughs> Oh, yes. Matt. Oh, But dear. we saved it beforehand. They Slippery said it was rocks. slippery. Yeah. We should. <laughs> you should stick. Oh, what's you should That's the same man. <laughs> stick to this. We need to find you a life preserver. A <laughs> life jacket? Don't go Something? chasing. Don't go chasing waterfalls. <laughs> exactly.
You know, that is kind of fun to try to die just to see the mm -hmm. quirky, uh, smokehouse, the quirky puns and stuff. Yeah, I, I um, the, oh, this, go ahead. Oh, this game, of course, is yeah very much inspired by the Colonel's Book Quest in terms of you know it's a house-based mystery, it's a text parser, it's the it looks like the SCI Zero engine. It's got this female red-headed protagonist, a, a lot, a lot of it, and I did look a lot, a lot of um, the house interiors when I was constructing my my own interiors. Um, yeah, I, I really think that game is something interesting and and a different a spin on design for for Sierra at the time. Where yeah, you couldn't necessarily soft lock yourself; you could kind of get to an ending just by wandering around, for the most part. Oh, Matt! <laughs> like, like she's just gonna start gnaw noshing on that. Yeah, I just want to. They said you could not though. Uh, hot. I was really impressed with the, your storytelling techniques in the in this you know like at the beginning how you know a lot of creative writing classes they talk about show don't tell mm. about the characters and i was noticing in your game there's lots of there's some good showing where you you let your characters do things mm. like the guy that just wants to ditch the two characters yeah. <laughs> not, not even ride home right and he's, he just leaves his suitcase uh they're <laughs> just assuming that the other you mm -hmm. know the, the guy's going to pick it up for him. And I'm like, that's, you know, that's a really good example because I really already hate this guy. <laughs> <laughs> you, you didn't have to say this guy's yeah. a jerk. This yeah. guy's, you know, this, that you, you see it happening in front of you. Yeah, uh, that was, and, and I'm glad you say that because I, you know, being an illustrator first and, and teaching myself to do the programming, this is the first thing I've ever kind of written really oh, wow. and I hadn't taken any kind of creative writing classes or anything like that. I just read a lot when I was a kid um, and I, I was kind of concerned that I'd be able to pull off something like this, where the story can go all kinds of different places and a lot of things going on and the characters with all these motivations that um, one of the criticisms that I've seen uh, in my reviews, which I think is totally valid, is that people say that the story is, is they feel like the characters are very like um, stock almost, like very standard and very like easy to understand. And they kind of feel like they, they knew what was, what was going on fairly early on. Um, but other people also say that they what they appreciated about i'm not going to spoil anything about it but what they appreciated about it was that yeah you might know basically what's going on fairly early on but you still need to back that up with your observations and your evidence for the rest of the game um so it's not just because oh i have this feeling that this person is up to something or something like that um and, and part of the reason that i did that is i was concerned that I, I wanted players to understand the story and that's part of the reason why i kind of made the characters simpler but another reason that i made the characters a, a kind of simpler was because it was the first thing I've ever written, and I was kind of concerned that I might not be able to pull it off um, to, to do something where there's a lot more subtlety and twists and things like that, because I didn't want to confuse people. Um, but seeing as people seem to like how the writing went with this one, you know, I'm kind of encouraged for in the sequel to do something that's a little bit more complex, a little bit more elaborate. Yeah, I think it's there's just different audiences for different types of fiction. I mean, mm. Father Brown, I could watch that all day. Yeah. <laughs> You don't necessarily need everything to be Games of Thrones level mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. complexity. <laughs> and I think too the with the genre, there's kind of the expectation to use tropes in a way, and that mm -hmm. you can it because at the beginning they always have to introduce so many characters all at once, yeah. and then once it gets going, of course you can subvert that, and um, you know like Ryan Johnson does in the Knives Out movie, mm -hmm. uh, things like that. Oh yeah. Uh, speaking of, you you mentioned the Murder on the Orient Express, um, you know, a little bit earlier, and I was just that immediately reminded me of the Ryan Johnson's uh, Knives Out movies, and it's just how incredibly um, uh, successful and popular those are, and just how people really love that style of of ensemble cast where the writing is super sharp and and there's some a lot of a sense of fun and a sense of mystery. Um, I was also super encouraged by that because I do really love that first Knives Out movie. Um, and in fact, um, in the introductory sequence of the game in, in, in the Crimson Diamond, there is a character called Professor Plummer, whom mm. I modeled after Christopher Plummer um, with, with a bit of a, a Professor Plum clue slant to him. But I mean, he basically looks like Professor um, Christopher Plummer. And people have said that even not knowing that that's what I intended. And that's because of because of Knives Out. Little gazebo. Mm -hmm. I got a question here from Lops Terminator. Mm -hmm. Julia is awesome. <laughs> Not a question. <laughs> I would like to hear. I would like to hear her design ideology when making a retro style game, 
as to what old gameplay tropes patterns she keeps and what she modernizes or streamlines. Yeah, yeah, we, we we've covered a little bit of this already. Where where there's not those easy deaths, where you have this sense of that danger, you could fall off the side of of a platform or I'll fall off the stairs really easily. Um, I did want to create this feeling of a cozy mystery atmosphere where you do feel like you kind of have a sense of safety almost, where you you don't have to worry about that type of danger or that hazard. That was that was part of it, as well as this idea that it's more like a book than a movie, where, as I mentioned, he said the player sets the pace for everything, for every text box you're clearing, for every event. The notebook explicitly t will tell you what you need to do to advance the story. If you want to just continue to explore and ask characters questions, you never have to worry about accidentally advancing the story, which does happen to be something in the Colonel's Bequest that I found very stressful, is this idea that I could walk in on a conversation. And, and you almost like needed to know, like Groundhog's Day, you needed to know ahead of time what would do that to avoid those those situations um, as you're playing the game. Um, that, that was another aspect of kind of the old school type of game design that I did not want to repeat. Um, but, the, you know, the games, those games also had a lot of good stuff in them. And there's a reason why we look back on them so fondly is because they did excellently set a setting and have characters and compelling writing and a lot of things to find. Uh, my, my philosophy was I was going to take the stuff that I liked about those games, and then also bring in stuff that didn't necessarily exist at the time. Um, I don't know whether it's a technical limitation or just something they hadn't considered. Stuff like, yeah, the graphical inventory is not something that we had in EGA games. We didn't have text port portraits in a, in a lot of these EGA games. I, don't, I can't think of a Sierra game that did have with EGA and also text ports. Maybe there is one, but I, I can't think of one at the top of my head. Having a notebook to to track your objectives. All these things are are things where I knew that I wanted the game to basically look like the old games, but I knew there were so many ways that we could improve upon that design just from you know the intervening 30 plus years that the games have been around. You mentioned the Colonel's Bequest a lot. What did you think of its follow-up, the Dagger of Alma? I love it. Yeah, I yeah. love it. There's so there's so much good there. Um I love the setting. I love this art deco look that the game has. It's it's very beautifully art directed. Um, I, I love the fact that um, that Laura Bow has more personality in that one. Like she has more dialogue and everything. You get to know what she's like a bit more. The the characters are incredible. The soundtrack is incredible too. It's one of my favorite soundtracks in an adventure game. I listen to it sometimes when I'm working. That that's how much I enjoy it. Um, yeah, it's 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 a lot of fun. I love them both for kind of different reasons. But I did take a lot of pages from both of those so-called books in this game. Like you you know we just saw the drinking glass, and that was something that was introduced in Dagger Van Wan Ra. That type of idea of listening at doors and at co with conversations. Um, but I did want to include that in my game because I did very much enjoy that part of it. Um, yeah, yeah, there, there's, a, there's a lot I took from both. In fact, I would say like game design wise, my game probably is takes more from Dagger of Elmon Ra, but it looks a lot more like Colonel's Bequest. Do you, you know what Sierra ever had plans to do a third one? Oh, or... of a lower bow? Yeah. I, yeah, I, you know what? I don't know. Um, for back in the day with Sierra? Mm-hmm. There was? Or no, there wasn't, but mm -hmm. I don't, I wonder, I mean, I'm just was thinking this would have made sense with full motion video <laughs> with this character, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wonder, I wonder why they didn't uh, end up going any other way with it. Yeah, I, I, that's another reason why I, I made my game is that I feel like, yeah, I, I loved that. That was like Laura Bow 1, Laura Bow 2, it would have been nice to see more of those Laura Bow games with that setting, and we didn't get them, unfortunately. Have you ever worked with a uh, product called Twine? I have not, but I know that it's you know, made you know, uh, for interactive fiction, and it seems like a pretty easy to use tool. That I, again, I'm super fan. Of, I'm super fan of easy to use tools because I do want more people to get that chance to make their own games. I got a course this semester where they're going to have the students use that to make a nice. game and so it's going to ask you to give them some advice because <laughs> <laughs> they've only they don't have unlimited time it needs to be yeah. something that can be played in about 10 to 15 minutes and, yeah you know it's, they're going to be watching some videos but if there's like a little kernel mm. of wisdom <laughs> let's see if yeah, for something that's 10 to 15 minutes um I guess from a story point of view, the way I would write some of my sequences in, in this game is there would be kind of like a, a scene that I thought would be very compelling. You know, whether it's an interaction between two characters or a character facing something or solving something. And from there, I would build around that to like how to lead to that moment. 
And if it's like a 10 to 15 minute thing, I might just yeah pick one moment that's kind of something that's in, been in your head, maybe of something that you find sort of interesting or compelling that you'd want to showcase. And everything else is built in service of that moment, um, okay. whatever else, like setting and things like that. Um, because I, that, that's kind of how I did approach this is that I, I didn't start from, I'm going to make a whole big game that is going to be seven to 12 hours to play, or I'm not, you know, I didn't set out to do that. I was kind of setting out to be like, okay, I've got this, a bunch of art and what am I going to do with it? What are things that I respond to? What, what are things that interest me? I guess, even from a subject matter standpoint, um, what interests me and what I already know, what, what stuff I already know about or what stuff that I want to learn about. Um, for a small project, maybe you're going to want to stick with something that you kind of are more familiar with that you're interested in. And you could use that as kind of a way to express something that you're interested in, which is what I did with like the mineralogy in this game. I learned so much more about minerals and rocks and geology than I had known before. I don't really had always been an interest for me, but making the game actually allowed me to further develop that interest. Um, and that's been super rewarding. Um, so I guess from a subject matter point of view, I might advise that as well. That's great. Well, the Nancy Drew games are good about that, by the way. <laughs> oh, <laughs> There's nice. always something like mini mineralogy or something like that <laughs> yeah. in there. So you feel like you're learning something. Yeah, yeah. That's another um, thing. Um, people have said that they feel like they're learning a bit of like mineralogy and geology as they play this game, which is kind of neat. Like it's very, very basic stuff. But yeah, um, at CR Games kind of did feel kind of like a secondhand uh, or, or a side effect was a bit of edutainment in a way because of the typing and the spelling and the vocabulary, but also like these, also these little bits of details you can pick up. Well, especially things like Gabriel Knight, right? Where you could ask 30 questions about voodoo to every <laughs> character. Yeah, like it, that, that stuff is really, really, or even something like Conquest of the Longbow that has a bunch of like yes. trivia and stuff. Yeah. Like you could learn about, you know, this, the, you know, I mean, it's not really historical record, but this, this, this kind of a very pop culture type of King Arthur's court and things. I mean, that there was a lot of uh, writing about those things and a scholarship that I think is very interesting and that and having, you know, the developer really get into that and give us like a manual that describes some of that stuff. It's it's very, very it makes it really compelling to to learn about. I agree. <laughs> did, um, Julia, did you play Return to Monkey Island? You know what? I have not. To my shame, okay. I have not. All no. right. Then I was I was going to say as an example, I mean, I'll keep it. I won't spoil anything, but there is a chapter that's set on a pirate ship. Mm. And it's a good way to, I think for Matt, your students, maybe you could use a, a let's play of it as an example of how you can do puzzles with maybe six rooms mm, nice. and a limited amount of inventory. And that it, it forces you to think of different ways to interact with a really simple environment and you can't leave that ship. And so you feel kind of trapped mm -hmm. and it adds to uh, what the character is feeling. Yeah, that's a really good point in terms of something that is small. Like when I was made this, I was trying to restrict it to like the lodge and this, you know, the, this outer area to restrict it to before so it wouldn't get too big. And that's another really good uh, piece of advice for making a small game is to like, keep it restricted to like one certain area where you only have a certain amount of rooms you can travel through. Yeah, that's especially in those games where you don't have a notebook and you have this mm -hmm. huge area. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's just like, what in the world? I'm totally stuck. Mm -hmm. yeah i didn't i didn't want people to get that stuck feeling i mean they can get it but maybe not for long because i people can very easily just put your game down nowadays there's just so many other games to play and that's part of the reason why i put this link this hyperlink to an online hint book that has the full hint book to the game i do want people to fully enjoy the game and not feel like they want to put it down because they're now stuck and there's no way forward yeah we think we're coming up on matt's gotta get back to work time mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's see. Can we look at the hint book quick, man? Is that possible? Yeah, sure. Um, That'll probably go. And it's... Stop sharing the screen. Or wait, is it going to take me out of the game, right? It's yeah. A... It'll open up a new window, but I'm not sure how that's going to work. It'll take you yeah. to a hotline where you're... <laughs> no, I'll, I'll just power. share the browser screen. Hold yeah, on. Yeah, okay. Yeah. This is how she makes your money right here. <laughs> I did put a donate button at the top oh. and the bottom of it. <laughs> right. So this, this yeah, is a real fun So you can donate. It's, uh, you can email. Yes. Yeah, skip to the chapter you want. Uh, I guess mm -hmm. we shouldn't skip ahead because of no spoilers. But oh, you do there's the map. A map. And this is like the old, um, yeah. with the LucasArts ones where you highlight, right? Yeah. The answers yeah. to see. And it's they get progressively more explicit. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's not. Oh, quit, quit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, I wanted something that was going to be easily accessible to people, and also like like that was uh, like even my 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 website is it feels like such a throwback. I wanted like a throwback website as well for the the hint book. Yeah, why don't we see the website? That'd be a good last thing to show. Mm -hmm. This is just great stuff. <laughs> oh, with the I see, yeah. Yeah, it just I animated. made this in Dreamweaver MX. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> But it, it looks even older. Like it looks like just something you would have made in like the early '90s or something. It's just... Appropriate. I like this. The press kit with the asterisks. Mm. <laughs> good, and you can have on Steam or what's it, it's? Oh, it's on Steam and Itchio. Yeah, and also yeah. A, a platform called Fireflower Games, as well. What's Fireflower Games? They're like a European uh, based. So if you oh. are you um, paying in euros, like that might be the one you want to choose. And uh, what about this dev blog? Did you? Yes. Is that something you kept up with pretty early in the process, or when did yes. you decide to do that? Yes. Yeah. Uh, this is issue seventy-one, I believe, of the dev blog. Uh, this wow. August twenty twenty-four one, and uh, yeah, I, I haven't missed one. Yes. So, it's it's been something I've been keeping up, and it's been wonderful because it gives me like a way to chronologically oh. record. Yeah, there we go. Roberta. Yeah, yeah, there she is. Oh, yeah, there's the box. Snuffers. Yeah, it's it's been wonderful because it's a good reference for me. Oh, there's yeah, there's Dan, my musician, who's wearing his uh, his crimson diamond shirt. Um, yeah, it's been a wonderful way, way for me to document like the articles and the reviews and podcasts and stuff and stuff I get up to, um, dev updates and things. It's It's been right. a great record for me, but it's also good a way for people to just, if they want to see what I've been up to from month to month, and this is a, a great way to do it. Um, you can subscribe to this as well. You can get this in your email box, um, especially for people who do want to like reduce their social media stuff. Um, that's a way to get it as well. Where do you get those t-shirts? You can order them. Um, I've got a fourth wall store. Oh, there it is. That that particular T-shirt though is um so that that particular <laughs> T-shirt I love oh yeah I've got that hat the sideways Nancy hat I've got it like um it's probably gonna get keyed out but I've got it like right here um <laughs> to, that particular um T-shirt that Dan has on it's not a design that's on this store and I should add it it's like one of the many t like things I need to add to my own store it's on on my to do list um because I do like that white logo on the black T-shirt but I, I have a color logo on the T-shirt here for some reason it's not being shown on like you have to kind of scroll up and say browse all for some reason um at the top right yeah that one it's going to show like the T-shirts and stuff as well it should anyway mm -hmm. uh, there there yeah so so I do need to to go in and um put the okay. white T-shirt there because I quite like it um yeah I do have a Society Six store as well which has a which has a few merch things as well. That's not a bad, only $15 for that. Yeah, it's 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 it's, it's quite a good price. They they ship out really, really quickly too, which is kind of nice. I, I do I do like that. And what's also really good about Fourth Wall is they have like Twitch integration, so I can like do giveaways on my channel while I'm streaming. I, I really like that as well. This is yeah. the Society 6. Yeah, so this is the one with, I think, the white logo t-shirt. Okay. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of other stuff on that, on that one. Yeah. Oh, there you go, this one. Uh, I think, uh, the, yeah, there should be a black and white one. I don't know, don't know where it is. But I do want to add that. Yeah, that I do like that. I want one for myself, I guess. That's why I want to add that other one to the fourth wall store. <laughs> is this pretty profitable? No, no. It's it's mostly for me to have my own stuff and also to do giveaways on my channel. Gotcha. Yeah. That's fun. Yeah, it's just cool to have at least these, you know, like the hat. I enjoy wearing the hat to events and things like that. So it's it's nice to have. Well, thanks for coming on. I know you must be feeling some pride. <laughs> yeah, it, it's really it, awesome it, achievement for you. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's been like a really it's been a really positive experience. Everyone has been for the most part like super supportive and and, and patient. Yeah, there are there I, I I've been encountering a lot of people at events or just even online saying that they've been waiting for this game for years and that it lived yeah. up to their expectations and they're super happy with it. Um, yeah, it feels it feels really nice to have that. Although I don't feel like I'm finished with it yet because yeah, I do have some bugs I need to get to. Um, but yeah, I feel I'm really grateful for just how wonderful everybody's been. And uh, the fact that the launch did go off smoothly. I mean, there are there were you know dozens of ways where it could have like not gone well, but tripped up, or I could have made a mistake here and there. Um, but uh, yeah, I I couldn't I couldn't be more pleased with how it, how it ended up. And uh, I hope people continue to play and enjoy the game. Uh, yeah, this is my my London trip. I went to Adventure X last fall, and of course, I of course oh. have to show over the fish and chips and and. Uh, and mushy peas, of course. Yes, of course. Yes. Did you have yeah. that? What do they call a steak and kidney pie? Did I have one during this trip? I can't remember. If I've, I never, I've never had that. I don't. 
doesn't sound that great to me. <laughs> <laughs> they're delicious I don't know about I've... the kidney part is it what does that taste like i wonder i don't know i think it's like a rich it's a nice rich soft meat it tastes very uh, really beefy chewy. oh it right. depends on how they cook it yeah, it's nice. this is the original hakusai yeah, yeah there's a few there's a few that are yeah. out there um but it was just really cool to see and, and a real one myths to manga I, mm -hmm. I, I um i briefly got to work with ken williams a little bit doing the closed beta for the colossal cave adventure remakes nice they did and so that was kind of full circle going mm -hmm. to get to work on that a little bit and also that they remade the very first uh a text adventure game that Roberta ever played. I think yeah. it was a cool way for them to start uh, yeah. first game from their company, Cygnus. Yeah, yeah. I actually, uh, at that uh, Adventure Game Hotspot Fanfare, I won the Switch version of Colossal Care Adventure that was, was signed by both Ken and Roberta. Oh, fun. So, yeah. Happy October. Mm hmm. Coming back around to October it. again soon. Is it is there a place for people to buy the game that oh, you would yes. prefer them to buy it? Other or is, is it do you make more money if they buy it? From <laughs> else, yeah, that's so, so. Here's the thing, like that's a that, like, that's a really really good question, and I've gotten it a couple times, and it's a kind of a hard one to answer. But I'm gonna I'm gonna like tell like give my best answer for that, and people can kind of decide. Um, like the the top level answer to that is wherever you buy it, I'm happy. But uh, there's a few things to consider. One of them is Steam does take thirty percent off the top of a sale. Um, Itch.io does not take 30% off the top of a sale. So I see more money from Itch.io versus Steam. But if you buy on Steam and you leave something like a review, then it really boosts visibility on Steam, which 95 to you know 99% of any sales from an indie game dev is going to come from Steam and not Itch.io um, and not from the smaller platforms. In which case, um, if you do buy on Steam and leave a review on Steam, it, it can impact by encouraging other people to buy it, mm. which could end up being more than that 30% take that Steam takes. Um, and that's why I tell people, um, I'm happy for you to buy wherever you feel like you want to best. Um, but if you actually do want my answer of like, what is the best place? Probably Steam. If you're going to buy it on Steam, leave a, leave a review for it. Um, that's going to, that's like the best way to support just about any indie dev that has anything on Steam. You could also buy it from multiple platforms. <laughs> oh yes. Nothing's stopping you. Nothing's stopping you from doing that. Um, <laughs> Although I will say uh, another vote in Fireflower Games and Itchio's favor is that those are DRM free. And there was someone on Twitter just the other day that was mentioning that um, you can you can play the game via ScumVM and ScumVM has an iOS app. Hmm. You can actually play this on your phone without too oh. much without too much work. Although to be fair, um, I have not tested the game on ScumVM. I don't know if it's fully completable through ScumVM, um, but I'm hoping that person will tell me how, what their experience is with it. Um, Hopefully it's going to be okay, but that's another vote in the the favor of the DRM free places. So it sounds like buy it on itch.io or <laughs> what's the other one? Firefly. Oh, fire, fire, Firefly, and also I'm um, I'm kind of on in the midst of trying to get it on GOG on GOG. Um, what, yeah, do we call it GOG? Do we call it GOG? I, I I ask everybody. I don't know. I call it GOG, but then GOG. Yeah. good old games. But if you want to leave a review, then go to Steam for sure. Yeah, that, leave that's... a review if you buy it on itch.io. Can you still leave a review on oh, Steam? Um, no, I don't think so because you only get the itch.io uh, access, you don't get a Steam key for oh. it. Yeah, wow, look at that. Game is amazing. <laughs> Recommended. Yeah, it's been it's been super positive. I think this is going to be really a big hit. Oh, thanks. I feel like what? it's too early to tell, but I would love to just go into making, you know, I would love this to be my my living, you know, like I'd love to dedicate yes. myself full time to making games. I really think with this game being so soothing and it's charming. <laughs> I mean, we we live in this this such a chaotic time. Mm -hmm. you know? It's just so nice to have an escape from that. And, yeah. you know, I know people that are still playing Stardew Valley. <laughs> yeah. Talk about it like it's a, almost a therapy. Yeah. Yeah. It was sure. therapy to make the game, you know, because yeah. I, I, I was in control of every aspect except for the music and Dan was awesome. And I could just make this little world to be in and and hearing that people feel the same way is, yeah, I, I, I love that, that people can feel that and feel that either nostalgia or just feel that comfort and that coziness. Wow, those reviews are great. Okay. Hey, well, thanks. Thanks, you too, Matt. Yep. Thanks. Yes, thank you. So keep us posted. I will. Thank you so much again for having me on from five years ago till now. We just, all oh, that what? time is, we've what? passed through. Um, yeah, we, here we are. We did it. It's done. <laughs> Yay. <laughs>
I'm hoping okay. in the next game she goes to space. Oh my goodness. Maybe okay, I, that okay, spoiler, she's not going to space for the sequel, but maybe the third one. If there's a third one, I don't know. We'll see. Okay. <laughs> And oh, that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, I really, uh, you know, I, I need to make, I guess, uh, a special appeal to you folks. Uh, if you like Matt Chat, you know, this is 537 episodes. I want to keep making this the show. I don't, uh, I'm not saying I'm going to quit anytime soon with this, but I am saying I just have to let you, uh, let you know that this is uh, getting kind of dire here. Uh, the support is just, been drying up. Uh, you know, Matt, Bradley, Shurgy, and I, we've been trying our best to get the best possible guests on the show, do the best uh, show we can do, basically. Uh, we put a lot of uh, work into this, but for whatever reason, we, we're losing uh, the financial support that we need to keep this show going. Uh, you know, so I, there it is. You know, it's, it's just been in decline for a while now. I'd love to know if you've got ideas, if there's things you want to see, if you think there's something uh, we could be doing better. Uh, if you've got ideas for maybe ways to get the word out more about the show, uh, any of that stuff, I'd really appreciate it. And of course, even better, if you can go to that Patreon site in the show, uh, in the notes for the YouTube video, uh, become a Ratron, you get on the Discord and support the show that way. Uh, that would be really, really super uh, excellent thing for you to do right now, because, uh, you know, as I said, this is getting <laughs> really bad. Uh, so I don't want to beg. <laughs> well, actually, I don't mind. I beg you, please, if you like the show, you want to keep it going, please go to the link in the show notes. Go to that Patreon site. A dollar, two dollars, you know, whatever the show was worth. You know, we're not trying to get rich here. We're just trying to keep the lights on and the show in production. So please, if you've been holding off, delaying, whatever the case may be, don't do that anymore. Go to that link. Go to the Patreon. Become a member of the show, member of the team. You really like the show better, and man, your help is really going to be super helpful right now, maybe more than ever. Yeah, so thank you very much. We're always grateful to uh, to everyone, regardless of you know how much you uh, donate to the show, or you know even if you're just liking the video, <laughs> even if you're just watching the video, <laughs> uh, but if you're sharing it with other people, letting uh, other people know about it, whatever it is you do to support the show, we are grateful. And remember. You can't spell gratitude without rat. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, so sorry to be a downer, folks, but we really do need your help. All right. What about that news from the Matt Cave? Uh, well, uh, I got some good news and some bad news. Uh, let's start with the good news, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> I don't want to give too much bad news back to back. Uh, all right, so Indie Retro News, a great blog, uh, has announced a game by Brandon Curie, or K-O-U-R-I. Not quite sure how to pronounce uh, your last name, Brandon, so sorry about that if I got it wrong. Uh, anyway, they have just released King's Quest VI AGI D-Make. <laughs> Not remake, D-Make. Uh, so what is that? It's a high-quality fan-made AGI recreation of, uh, of course, uh, King's Quest VI, Air Today, Gone Tomorrow. Now, the original game came out in 1992. It had 256 color VGA graphics. Uh, so this reverts back to the 16 color graphics and typing interface of the games that came before. Uh, so very appropriate that this would be coming out around the same time as uh, the Crimson Diamond. Uh, and of course, uh, I don't know if, uh, I didn't write this down here, but there's also an Atari ST version. I was just reading about that, so uh, really cool news, especially if you are a fan of the classic game. All right, and then Pony uh, writes in, I guess this is a lot of sad stuff here, okay? <laughs> so, uh, so to shift uh, tone, uh, there's a game called Concord. You might have heard of this. I didn't uh, play it myself, and apparently I'm not alone in <laughs> not playing it, because uh, it is being shut down already. This is a big uh, fiasco, basically a disaster. It's kind of sad, really. Uh, for Sony, uh, yeah, just two weeks after this game launched, uh, apparently it's done so poorly in the sales department, they just decided to shut the whole thing down. And that's even though it cost, uh, well, 
Apparently we don't know what the actual budget was for this game, but uh, it's probably safe to assume about a hundred million dollars. Uh, that's according to uh, Forbes. And maybe this could be one of the highest profile flops uh, of all time we're talking about here. If the cells, uh, if we're to believe some of these numbers, I mean, I've read a couple spots where they say only 25,000 units uh, of this game were, were, were sold. So this is a pretty big deal. You know, it doesn't frankly bode well. <laughs> you know, even if uh, you're not a fan of this type of thing, you know, it is alarming to see something like this happen and you wonder what the ripple effects might be uh, throughout the industry. So that is really unfortunate. You know, I, I never want anybody to fail. <laughs> you know, some people seem to be like that. They like to get on, a, uh, you know, reviews, review bomb things and uh, just try to try to point out all the flaws uh, with everything. You know, I want people to be successful, even if it's not a game that I personally would be interested in. You know, because I think about the employees and, the, uh, you know, people that don't deserve... Uh, uh, you know, to be dragged through the dirt for whatever it is. But, but anyway, that's sad. Uh, I guess there's one silver lining here. Uh, you will be getting the refunds if you purchase this, at least on uh, Steam. Yeah, six to eight years on this game. Really sad. Uh, I don't really know anything about it. Maybe you've got some theories as to why it failed so bad. Love to hear those. Let's so share those on YouTube. All right, then finally, uh, again, <laughs> sorry with all the sad stuff, but uh, the wizard, uh, this is Miko wrote in about this. Uh, Pony wrote in about the Concord game. Uh, so the Wizardry co-creator, uh, Andrew Greenberg, has unfortunately passed away at the very young age of 67. Uh, I wasn't able to find uh, any details about this, not that it's anybody's business, but you know, it is a, a terrible thing. Uh, somebody this talented to pass away uh, relatively young and of course he's did one of the best or co-created one of the best games of all time wizardry uh, which is a series I really love and I'm sure a lot of uh, you do as well now Robert Woodhead I've had on the show and I saw he was uh, uh, tweeting about this as well so very sad uh, best wishes to uh, Andrew's family and friends I really wish I'd have had uh, the chance to talk to talk to him have him on the show but you know, that's sadly the nature of this business. You know, a lot of these uh, developers, I try to get them on the show. Uh, I don't like to ever think about it, but, you know, it's, it's happened a few times where I've managed to get somebody to interview them, uh, and then shortly thereafter, they're, they're gone. And this might be the only chance uh, they've ever had to tell their stories. Uh, so it always saddens me uh, to think about things like that, but, you know, it is just one more reason uh, to support the show or <laughs> similar. Uh, shows that are trying to preserve uh, the game legacy, uh, preserve interviews, and uh, you know, let people get a chance to see what these uh, folks are like uh, before it is too late. But uh, anyway, very sad, and best wishes to the Greenberg family. All right, let's wrap it up with a quotation then. And uh, I was looking for quotes by Agatha Christie, who, uh, you know, I've read several of her novels, My Mother. I was a huge Agatha Christie fan. I think she had read all the books <laughs> at one point or another. Uh, we had a lot of fun. My dad was really into science fiction, and so I'd read science fiction books like uh, Arthur C. Clarke, uh, we talk, and or uh, uh, Orson Scott Card, that sort of thing. Uh, and then we talk about the books. But my mother was really into Agatha Christie, so we'd uh, she'd read one, and then I would read it, and we'd try to you know guess you know who's going to be the uh, who did the murder? You know, can we solve the mystery? Uh, so it was a lot of, I got a fun, a lot of fun childhood memories about her novels. Uh, and I think this quote uh, really kind of joins all that together well. It goes something like this. One of the luckiest things that can happen to you in life is, I think, to have a happy childhood. So ponder on that and I'll see you guys next time.
This sort of thing has cropped up before, and it has always been due to human error.